Good morning. I, I gave y'all an extra minute this morning, but we've got to quit fellowshipping and start studying the Bible together. Thank you for being here. This morning, we'll, if you have your book, we'll be starting on page 65. If you're in your Bible, we'll be starting with John chapter 10. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning to enjoy this wonderful day of worship together. Uh, had quite a few visitors at the early service, and we're thankful for that. Uh, we pray for those that are still dealing with uh, illnesses, uh, particularly our brother Tim Shoemaker remains in the hospital, and it may be an extended stay for him, so we pray that, that he'll be able to uh, have total healing from his ailments that's going on now. But uh, thank you for being here. I want to thank Bob for that great class last week. Uh, I didn't get to watch it. I think it was Monday night, but it was very good, excellent. I'm sorry I gave you 42 verses to cover in 41 minutes, but... It, uh, it was a great class, and uh, so we'll, uh, I felt a little guilty today because I'm only going try to try to cover uh, 21 verses, and I thought, well, it wasn't fair to Bob, but uh, there are so many things here. If we, if we spent the time we needed to spend, we might not finish this book to a year after next, but uh, there's nothing more important than the life of Christ. When Jesus came and lived on this earth and then he died and was resurrected, he changed the history of the world forever. And uh, so it's, it's well worth our time to think about what Jesus did here on his life and, and being resurrected from the dead. Uh, Bob talked about the man last week that was healed from the blind. He was born blind, the only time in the Bible that there was a man born blind and then healed from blindness. And the conclusion on page 65 says, we're not told what happened to this man who received his sight. We don't know what he did for the rest of his life. But we do know there was consider considerable consequences because he had been put out of the synagogue because he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And then later on, he got to speak with Jesus himself. So it was a life-changing event for him, both physically and spiritually. And that's what Jesus is for us. It is a spiritual awakening that we have the hope of eternal life. Uh, let's, uh, let's start with prayer this morning. Father, we thank you so much for, for the written word you've given us, for the opportunity to study it, to think about you and your love and your grace, and to think about the life of Christ, uh, his death, his burial, his glorious resurrection. We're very thankful for all of that, Father, and we we, we just cannot uh, thank you enough for your grace and your mercy that you brought to us. Forgive us for the things we do wrong and the things we leave undone. Help us to always be worthy of being called Christians. Is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. I may uh, be guilty of skipping around a little bit this morning. I went over this lesson probably three times yesterday and this morning, and every time I skip around a little bit, so I, I'm, I'm not scatterbrained. Well, I may be, but uh, there's some things in here that I want us to see. And uh, in John chapter 11, we're going to see that twice Jesus says that I am. And I want us to start with that thought. In John... Actually, in the Bible, over 1,100 times the word I am is there. But when Jesus spoke these terms, I am, he was teaching a lesson. And there are seven I am's in the book of John that stand out of lessons that Jesus tried to teach him in proclaiming that I am. And we're going to see two of those in chapter 10. But I want us to think about the, the seven I am's. Can you remember what they were? I couldn't remember last night. I had to look up a couple of them. But, pardon? Revelation 1-8, right. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega. He made that proclamation. So what I'm really looking for, and that's a great answer, but what did he say specifically in the book of John, the eight, the, the seven I am's? Well, remember, he's going to tell us here when we read it, I am the door. He says in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. He had already said in John chapter 6, after feeding the 5,000 food, he says, I am the bread of life. In John 8, we talked about it a few weeks ago, he says, I am the light. And what's so important about life is it gives life. Light gives life. And so Jesus says, I, I am. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the door to the gate. But he did say also in John 11, as in over in Revelation, I am the resurrection and the life. And then in John 14, one of my favorite verses is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so in these proclamations, and there was one other in John 15, 1, he says, I am the true vine. You know, my father's the, the vine, you're the branches, but I am the true vine. And so as these proclamations, he was referring to his deity of being God with us. And we're going to see that there was uh, some reactions to these, these uh, statements that he made. But let us start reading on page, uh, I mean, in John 10, and I'm going to read uh, uh, down through uh, verse 10. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeepers open, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and, they le and leads them out. Where he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of the strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said unto them again, Truly, truly, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now to understand exactly what all he's saying here, we need to get some sort of a picture of what a sheepfold is. The shepherds would normally keep their sheep out in the open ranges, in the fields, feeding through the daytime. But you know, they like us on our jobs, they need a break. And so from time to time, they'd take their sheep to a sheepfold, sort of like a corral. And they would put the sheep into the sheepfold and leave them there overnight where they could go and do other things. But the sheepfold was a unique place because it only had one door. Sheepfold only had one door. And it had a doorkeeper. And the doorkeeper would only let the shepherd come and claim his sheep the next day. So here's the sheepfold, one door. And then Jesus says, I am the door. There's only one door to get to God, and that's through Jesus. He says, I, I'm the door. If you want to enter into the fold, which is the church, if you want to enter in, I want you to understand, I'm the door. He goes on and he says, verse 11, I'm the good shepherd. Well, what did shepherds do, generally speaking? Take care of the sheep. That's what their job was. Some shepherds were hired hands. And like any other job that you might find, some hired hands 
don't care about their job. They care more about the paycheck. Have you ever ran into that anywhere? So some shepherds were not good shepherds. But Jesus says, I am the shepherd. A good shepherd loves his sheep. A good shepherd protects his sheep. A hired person, when they're there and a wolf comes, they run. But a good shepherd protects his sheep. We've got to understand it being in the fold, into the church, into God's family. We have a Savior, and he's our Savior, and he's there to protect us. He's there to take care of our needs. He's there to make sure that that we can have this abundant life that he planned on us having when he came to this earth. So he said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. If danger came and his sheep was in danger, he'd even put his life out on the line to save the sheep. Well, what did Jesus do? He put his life on the line where he could save the sheep, and that would be us. Jesus went to the cross, and we're going to see in a few verses later, it, it wasn't, he, he went to the cross because he wanted to be our shepherd. But he says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own. My own know me. Even as the Father has known me, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Well, before we get any further in that, I want us to talk for a moment about this last word in chapter, uh, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. He came that the sheep could have life and it abundantly. Well, that's us. My question is, my thought is, what is abundant life? Jesus says, I came to lay down my life for you where you can have an abundant life. I think what we need to ponder is, what is abundant life? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Plentiful. You know, when he talked about having an abundant life, brother, he didn't say you're going to have a lot of houses and money and cars. He's talking about we're going to have everything we need that pertains unto life and godliness. We have plenty. Do we need plenty of grace? Amen. We need God's mercy and we need his grace. And there's plenty of it. Yes, sir. I like to say, if you give your child good things, how much more the father? You don't give your child a serpent or a stone. So he, you wouldn't do that. He certainly wouldn't do that for us. So he gives us the good life abundant. Absolutely. One of the one of the great things that we need to come to terms with is the first thing Brother Merrill said. God gives us peace. We have a peace that passes the understanding of this world. And that peace is, we know who we are. We're from God. We're God's children. We've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We know what our purpose is. Our purpose is to keep God's commandments and to serve him. And that's our purpose. And we have this abundant life in his purpose. But I think one of the greatest things we have about peace is we know where we're going. When this life is over, if we stay faithful, we're going to heaven. And that brings a peace that passes understanding. That if suddenly for some reason we pass away, we'll wake up in eternity with our Savior Jesus Christ. We'll go into paradise. We'll go into eternal life. And, and so there's that peace. But it, it goes even beyond that. But uh, that was a great answer. I gave Linda this quiz this week. Tell me what abundant life means. And she says it means joy. I couldn't get y'all to quit talking to start class. You know why? We were, enjoy we were enjoying joy. It's good to see you. It's good to touch you. I went around before the first service this morning touching people and hugging them and I went by one lady and she says, man, this is great. This is my third hug this morning from you. 
I got a short memory, I guess. But isn't it great to have this thing called joy? We know who we are. We know our purpose. We know our destiny. We can have peace, but boy, what joy we can have. We know that all things work toward the good of those that love the Lord. When something bad happens in our life, God's going to use that later on in our life for someone else's benefit. There's Priscilla Newton sitting up here, smiling as normal. Priscilla had both her feet removed, had them amputated. And it was a dark, dark time, wasn't it? Real dark time. But you know, she's used that experience multiple times to encourage people that were having amputations, even those among our own number here. So when something bad comes our way, we've got to know that God's going to use it in the future to help someone else. That, that brings us joy. I know what my purpose is. It's serving God. Right. Right. We speak about how they touch people's lives and how exactly. they make a difference. Fantastic. You know, in people's lives and you know, and how I may have learned about Christ through that individual or something of that nature. Right. You know, and to me that's an abundant life. Abundant life. Man, I, I wish everybody could have heard all that, but uh, abundance means overflowing, m multi. Uh, first thing popped in my mind, brother, was last weekend we went to a retreat down in uh, Mobile. Uh, with the Wetumpka congregation, and uh, they said in there, at, at the meals, we're not going to serve desserts. There'd be no dessert served with the meals while we're here Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But we're going to put out a couple of tables, and everybody bring your favorite desserts and put it on that table, and it'll be available 24 hours a day. Is that abundance or what? <laughs> Nutty Buddies is one of my favorites also. And I first passed at the table, there was a box of Nutty Buddies. Hadn't been opened, so I opened them up and poured them out on the table. They wasn't homemade, but they sure were good. And later on, I got to thinking about that. You know, that box only had about 10 Nutty Buddies in it. Maybe I better go back and get another one. And I went back over there, and guess what? There is a case, not a box, but a case of Nutty Butters that someone had brought. I guess they bought them at Sam's. There was an abundance of Nutty Buddies. Last week when I was at that retreat, it was fantastic. I gained right at five pounds. The good news is I've lost four of them already. But abundance means plenty. You're going to have plenty in this life. You're going to have joy. You're going to have peace. You're going to have fellowship. That's what we were having before class started. We have an abundant life. We have fellowship. You know, we'll, we'll say, how you doing? And, and someone will say, I'm doing fine. And then we'll sometimes we'll say, okay, now tell me the truth. You know, well, my back's hurting, my leg's hurting, or whatever it is. But even with our ailments, we have an abundant life. We have fellowship with one another. One of the things that makes this life an abundant life is we have forgiveness from our Savior. I don't know what forgiveness of your sins does for you in your life, but it gives me a clean conscience. It helps my conscience. When I go to bed at night, one of the last prayers we pray, pray is, God, forgive us for the things we've done wrong are left undone today. And I can go to bed with a clear conscience, knowing that my soul is in a right relationship with God. So one of the abundance of life is, is forgiveness that we have from God. One of the things of the, of, of the abundant life that we listed was, we have the hope of heaven. 
not like a wish that I want to go to heaven, but the hope of knowing that it's there and that we're going to accomplish it. Another point that we listed as part of the abundant life is we have the power of prayer. One time I had to go to the state house in Montgomery to check to see if my company had got a bid that we'd bid on. And while I'm in there, the governor of the state of Alabama walked through. I've never spoke to a governor before. You know, they're kind of hard to get to. But he stopped and shook my hand, and we had a conversation, and he asked me why I was there, and we had this conversation. And I felt so good that the governor of Alabama would take enough time to talk to me. But put that in perspective. The God of creation will take time to talk with you. You read his word, he's talking to you. You go to him in prayer, and he's listening to you. What an abundant life we have. We have the power of our prayer. Part of the abundant life is serving God, but it's also serving other people. Abundancy is serving other people. Giving. One of the joys of peace is, is understanding that we must learn to be givers. Liberal givers of our money to the Lord, but also liberal givers of our talents and of our time and of the things that we have sharing with other people. One part of the uh, abundant life is, and we'll get back to the lesson is, we know we have a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You ever heard that before? You were talking about going to funerals. Just about 90% of the funerals go to, you'll see this verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Why would you not want? Because you'll have an abundance. I won't lack anything. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear I, I fear no evil, for you are with me. That means now. Our Savior's with us now. Your rod and your staff, they, that staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Abundance. My cup overflows. Now. Surely goodness and love and, love and kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what the abundant life is. Realizing we'll be in heaven for eternity. That and all these other things and probably a whole lot more we, we didn't mention. But we have this thing called abundant life. Starting at verse 11. John 10 verse 11. I am the good shepherd. We said shepherds take care of the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own knows me. Even as the Father knows me, I have known the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep. In this verse, Jesus says, I'm the shepherd, I know the sheep, and the sheep know me. I want to read this statement. There is an eternity of difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. Did I hear an amen? Amen. There's a, a, there's a whole world difference in knowing something about Jesus and knowing Jesus. 
And this is what we struggle with in our life, is knowing Jesus. He is our good shepherd. I want us to look at uh, Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 7, talking about knowing Jesus. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Now, this is Paul speaking. He's writing this letter to the church at Philippi. He says, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He says, knowing Jesus is valuable more valuable than anything we could ever have. For I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ and may, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own but derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Knowing God, I mean knowing Christ is based on our faith. How much faith do we have? That that I'm, that I'm, verse 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Now this verse just happens to fall on what we call Easter Sunday. The world celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate that weekly, but it is a fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And he says, I can know the power of the resurrection. Jesus said, I'm the door. I'm the shepherd. I'm the life. I'm the truth. And we can know these facts, but to really be in the right relationship with Jesus, we need to know Jesus Christ is our Savior. Now that, not that I've already attained it or have become perfect, but I press on so that I, might, that I may lay, lay hold for that which I was laid hold of, of by Christ Jesus. He said, you know, I hadn't uh, obtained everything, but I, I keep pressing forward. I think we all find ourselves there. I certainly had achieved perfectness. Uh, the Bible says, be ye therefore perfect, and we're only perfect in God's eyes when he looks at us through the blood of Jesus. But he says here, I, I, I press on to the mark. I press on to being per perfection. I press on of living that Christian life in Christ Jesus, of knowing him as the Savior of the world. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold on it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and reaching forward to that which lays ahead. That forgetting what's behind is getting our conscience cleaned. We, we, we remember the past, and, and the past is important, but we can't live in the past. We've got to press on toward the mark. I press on toward the gold for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect. Now, remember, we're only perfect through the eyes of Jesus, uh, or through the blood of Jesus in the eyes of God. Have this attitude in you, and if any... Uh, and anything you have a difficult attitude, God will reveal it to you also. Let us keep living by the same standard to which we have attained. And he said, so knowing Jesus is one thing, just knowing facts, but knowing him as our door, as our shepherd, is a very key and important ingredient in our lives. Now if I can find my way back to the book. I've forgotten where we got to in the book. Okay. My daughter said, somewhere along seven. Okay, let's, go, let's drop back down to 11, where he says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did. We're his sheep, he laid down his life. He gave his life on the cross for us. He says in verse 14, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own knows me. 
That's where we got into the thought of it's not just knowing facts, but it's knowing him as our Savior, as the only way to get to God is through Jesus Christ. He said in verse 16, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Now he's talking about the Gentiles here, we believe. He says, I have other sheep that's not in this fold, but I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down of my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Jesus Christ being crucified on a Friday was not the result of a, of a court. It was not the result of a mob, but it was the result of God's plan of redemption. Jesus says he knows he's about three, three and a half months away from Jerusalem going to the cross. And he says, I'm going to give my life but they're not taking it away from me. I'm giving it. I'm the good shepherd. I'm going to lay down my life for my friends. So I'm going to give my life. Any thoughts about that verse? When Jesus taught, there was always those that understood what he said, and there was always those that didn't. Verse 19 says, a division occurred again among the Jews because of these words. Now, he's in an audience, and he says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the door to the fold. And they heard these words, and there was division. Many of the Jews, many of them were saying, he has a demon. He's insane. This person that claims to be God, he's nuts. He's saying, I'm the good shepherd. No, wait a minute, that can't be right. We have the old law to live by. And so some of the Jews were saying, he's, he's demon-possessed. But remember, he had just healed the blind man. In verse 21, others were saying, these are not the sayings of a demon-possessed a demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? Some of the Jews were believers. They were starting to believe in Jesus. They were using their mind. They witnessed the healing of the blind man. And then some of them said, well, he's just demon-possessed. What are you talking about? Demons don't heal people. Demons uh, don't care for people. He, he's not insane. He, they started believing what he said. I'm the door. And I'm the life. Over on page 67, it says, that in the middle of the page, it says, the latter part of John 10, 10, 10 is one of the greatest statements about Jesus that came into the world. He came to bring us an abundant life, this does not mean that we have an abundance of money or other things. It means that the only life worth living is life in Christ. The Christian life is the best life. The Christian life is the best life. Why is that the case? Because the Christian life is we're close to our Father. Our Father is God. We're here today to worship God through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I'm the door, I'm the shepherd. You're here to worship God. And, and so he says that uh, uh, the only life worth living is in Christ. So the Christian life is the best life. In Luke 15, and because of time we won't go there. <coughs> oh, excuse me. 
In Luke chapter 15, we have three parables. The lost sheep. It was rejoicing in heaven when that one sheep was found. There was a lost coin. It was rejoicing when the coin was found. But the third parable there is the story of the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son, he was with the father. He was raised by his father. He lived with his father. He sort of had it made, I would think. But one day he decided, you know, I, I, I paraphrasing, but I can't imagine him going to his daddy and saying, you know, Dad, one of these days you're going to die and I'm going to inherit your money. But I don't want to wait for you to die. I want my money now. Now I know what my daddy would have done. <laughs> After about three cartwheels and a slap on the head, you know. But you know what is amazing about this story is his father said, I'm going to give you what you want. And he gave his, him his inheritance. And he gathered up all his possessions and he left his father. And he went off into a different life. I mean a life of abundancy. He went and wasted his money, riotous living. He wasted his money on prostitutes. He wasted his money on friends. And he spent everything he had living the good life. But one day, he came to a realization I need to go back to the Father. Back to the Father where there's an abundance. There's plenty. His servants have it better than I have it. I need to go back to my Father. The abundant living, the life of Christ, what you and I are doing, it is magnified by the fact that we have an abundancy because we have God. And so when we come back to God, we can have that abundant life. I, I remember that story in Luke chapter 15. He, he made up a saying. He says, now I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell my father I've sinned against him and against heaven. And I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just make me a servant. Because see, with the father, there's plenty. He said, just make me one of your servants. But you know, you know what happened. While he was still away off, his father saw him and his father ran out and hugged his neck. That's what God does to us when we repent. He hugs our neck. He forgives us. And then he said, Father, I'm not worthy of being called your son. And he, and he says to his servants, bring the best robe. Bring, bring a ring and put it on his fingers. Uh, bring some sandals and put on his feet. Kill the fatted calf. Because my son was lost. And now he's found. The abundant life is the life we live serving God being with our Father, knowing that Jesus Christ is the door and he's the good shepherd and he will have given us abundance of life. Next week we're going, I think next week we don't have Bible class if I'm not mistaken. We'll be having a seminar and I think seminar will take up our Bible class time. But if that's the case, week after next, we'll be talking about where Jesus sent out the 70 to go tell people that the kingdom of heaven is near. And we'll talk about that in two weeks. Thank you for your attention. I hope I didn't ramble around too much. But the abundant life, the life with God, with the Father, is the best life. Let's close with prayer. Father, we come to you and call you our Father and call you our God. We're thankful, Father, that we know that Jesus Christ is our Savior, that we can walk in that light. We can serve you, Father, for the rest of our lives, and then we'll have eternal home in heaven. Thank you, Lord, for this abundant life that we're living at this time. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.